Amen, BC. Here we go. Come on. Man, it's great to see you this morning. You may have a seat. Can we say thank you to our worship team? Just crushing it this morning. So good. Man, so good. Come on, I want to get into this Psalm 23. Come on. Here we go. Here we go. Psalm 23. Uh, we'll probably go to Numbers 14. We added that in the, in the first service. Come on, Brennan. Amen. B, how about B-Man? Can we give him thanks, please? It's just incredible. I love it. Are you ready for Seek? Like, my man is ready for Seek. Like, he's ready for Seek. There's actually a quick discussion in the back. Don't hold me to this. But someone said, hey, if the Bills are in the, the Super Bowl, unlikely, but if the Bills are in the Super Bowl, um, can we do something different for Seek? Because it's always that first Seek in February. Uh, if the Bills make it for Super Bowl, we might have to renegotiate some things. But uh, probably not. Probably not. Big game today against the Dolphins. Hey, good luck. <laughs> Man, hey, you guys are legit. I play. I play. Come on, here we go. This is what, this is what I know, man. This year, uh, to be done with 2020, bouncing into 2021, we walk in a place where we are excited about what's ahead for 2021. We're excited about the, the, the series that's going to be coming up here pretty quickly. We're going to be talking on marriage and going into a marriage series. Uh, and I, I'm pumped about having different people communicate in that. And we're going to have like a round table, table discussion in that. This series is going to be an amazing series, hopefully kicking in the next few weeks or so. And then, and then we're going to get into a worship series. And what does it look like for 2021 when your song turns to worship? We are called, according to Psalms, to sing a joyful song. And that's a beautiful sound to the Lord. And there's joy in that. And there's celebration in that. And we're excited about that. But then there's this switch that takes place from when your song goes to worship. When your singing comes to a place to, to, to flip the switch, when your singing turns into worship. And you can, you can just sing a song and it's not worship until there's this understanding of what it means to sing and then turn it into worship. And that's going to be a powerful, powerful series. We're excited about that. Uh, I wanted to do something in January. I flipped it to February. There will be a Sunday night in February. It will not be the Super Bowl. There will be a Sunday night because we got to watch the Steelers. There will be a Sunday night um, in February, and, and I was going to do it in January, but I kind of wanted this COVID crazy to kind of rest a little bit. And, and it's going to be a night where we're going to gather Sunday night, and I'm going to walk you through and teach you uh, Crayola Twistables in a sense of Bible marking. And we're going to bring our Bibles. We're going to mark our Bibles. I'm going to have a whiteboard up here. We're going to figure out all kind of cool ways to communicate on what's it look like to study your Bible and what's it look like to mark your Bible. Uh, so if you want, you can go out and buy Crayola Twistables. Don't get the scented ones because they stink. You got that. First service was a little sleepy, but you got that. They're just, they're not good on, on the onion paper, man. They're not good. Uh, they don't do well. Whatever they put in it to make them scented or smelly, it doesn't work great. Don't get the erasable ones. Uh, they don't work so great. Just get the regular pencil, twistable Crayola. I got stock in Crayola, and they pay me for this. It's incredible. No, I don't, but um, we should, right? BC should be sponsored because we sell more Crayola twistables than Walmart does. So it's anyways, um, we are excited about doing this in February. It'll be a Sunday night in February, and we will go through Bible marking and a Bible marking system and what does red mean and what does blue mean and what does green mean and orange and yellow and the whole crew, and we're excited uh, to be able to do that. It'll be a Sunday night in February. So there's a lot that's coming up that we can be really excited about. And you come to a place today when I want to get into Psalm 23. And again, if you were here last week, you know that we started this psalm, and, and I'm excited that you were here last week, and if, if you're new to BC and you're just checking us out, man, we're so pumped. We're so pumped that you're with us today. Whether you're here, whether you're checking us out online, whether you're home uh, watching online, we welcome you. We're excited you're with us this morning, um, and I'm just excited to be here today to, to finish out Psalm 23, and this is an amazing, victorious powerhouse, bold psalm as we started last week in the boldness of Psalms, in, in, in Psalm 23. This is a psalm, it's probably one of the most well-known passages in Scripture, probably. John 3, 16, yeah, we get it. But then it's Psalm 23. It's in, it's in many movies, it's in most funerals. When somebody's going through a hard time in a movie, they turn to Psalm 23. If there's darkness, they turn to Psalm 23. Like, if you were to start this psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, almost anybody could say, I shall not want. It's just like repetitive. And I want to make sure that even today as we communicate 
from Psalm 23, it just isn't, it isn't that. It's not just repetitive. It's not like, hey, I memorized that in children's church. I got it already. Yeah, I re- I've read it. I got it. I understand. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I hope you know. Yeah, I know it. I can, I can spit it out verbatim. I can do it in my sleep. I think that could be the problem at times when something becomes so familiar that we skim coat it. And here to last week we started to go deep, and this week we go deep, and let's pull some things from Psalm 23 and to realize the relationship piece to this. The relationship piece to the shepherd and the sheep. The relationship piece that, that David, who, who is the author of Psalm 23, he, he was a shepherd in his younger years. I believe that he writes this in his older years. He, he was a shepherd in his younger years. He writes this with a deep understanding of the sheep and the need for the sheep to have a shepherd. You understand something? When you understand shepherd and, and sheep, the sheep cannot make it. They are completely 100% dependent upon their shepherd. If there's no shepherd, the sheep will die. If there's no shepherd, the sheep will wander and eventually end up dying to to another animal or they'll fall into a raging river and their wool will get full of water and they'll fall in and they can't swim. Like there is a point in the depth of Psalm 23 where, where we see throughout Scripture that God the Father and God the Son are communicated to us that they are called the good shepherd, the shepherd, and the great shepherd to understand that they themselves are the shepherd and that we are the sheep and we are 100% dependent, solely, fully dependent upon the shepherd or we will not survive. And that is the depth of this psalm. To understand that relationship between sheep and shepherd. Understand the relationship of us fully depending upon him as our shepherd. And we covered last week the first three and a half verses. We talked about three uh, into four. We're going to get back into verse four here in a little bit. And we're going we're gonna to go deep into a relationship of the shepherd and the sheep. And I want this to relate to you and I in such a place that we walk out of this place knowing the word of God is alive and powerful. Man, if I put this in to my spirit today, if I digest this into my soul, there will be a change, an internal change as we read something that has power. We read something that has life. We read this, which is truth, which is God's word to us. Man, we don't just come play church. In 2021, we're going to get juiced up, man. We're going to get pumped. We're going to preach. We're going to get aggressive. We're going to see change. We're going to see life change. We're going to see souls won. We're going to see marriages on top of their A game. We're going to walk in a place to see God do a work because we've come back to a place to trust his word is absolutely true. And we're going to live it out like we believe it. Who's with me? You with me? Amen. Amen. Come on, 2021, I told the first service, I need a lot of love this year, right? I need a lot of love. When I'm preaching, I need you getting juiced, man. I need some amens. I need some claps. You can stand up and say, preach it. Don't throw anything at me. But you can, you can get me going, right? That's what I'm looking for in 2021. First service, they were juiced. They were ready for that. Second service, I can tell already, you slept well. You're ready to go. Drink. <laughs> Who was that? My man. I had Brian the first service, and I got my man Jay the second service. It's going to be a heck of a day. Are you ready? Come on, let's pray. Come on, amen. Father, we give you this time, and we ask that you would speak to us by your spirit and through your word. God, it's amazing that the God of all power and might wants to speak directly to us today. We love you. We're amazed by you. Speak into our souls today. In Jesus' name, come on, amen. I asked my wife, I said, do you think I can wear my, as a Christmas gift, my vest, is BC gear. I'm like, can I wear my vest? She's like, well, I'm picking the shirt you're putting under. I said, I wasn't even going to wear a shirt. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> She's like, no, I'm picking the shirt. I had one picked out. I don't know if I'm the only man in the house, but um, in this house, that when you have clothes picked out, sometimes that's not what you end up wearing. I don't know. That's just me, right? I had something else picked out. She's like, no, you're wearing this shirt. I'm like, yes, dear. Marriage advice. Yes, dear. Here we go. But I look at 2021, and honestly, a part of this is I really want us to be givers this year. And I'm not even speaking of generosity in in finances. I'm speaking in spirit in a sense of I don't want to walk in a place of what I can get out of this anymore, but it's more what I can put into this. And I'm speaking of a relationship with me and Jesus. If I were to ask you, hey, how's your wife? Hey, how are you and your wife doing? 
you would have a good response. In, in a sense of you would know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with your relationship. Hey, how, how are you and your wife doing? You know what, we're doing good. Hey, uh, we believe it's going to be a great year. We're growing. Man, it's, it's, been, it's been a good year. We've come off of 2020. It's been a good year. You know, our communication is good. We're, we're, we are loving one another. We're respecting one another. We're honoring. Like, we're in a good place. Me and my wife, are in a good place. Like, that's a great question. But if I were to ask you, how are you and Jesus? Some people wouldn't know how to respond to that because they don't understand. Watch this. They don't understand that it's a relationship. They don't understand that marriage was even set up. and The mystery is great that I'm referencing Christ in the church, that he references us, me and Renee, as a husband and a wife to walk in a place to represent Christ in the church based off this amazing relationship. So even this year, I ask you, coming off of 2020, how are you and Jesus? Because if I ask you, hey, how's your wife? You have a response to that. Man, we're struggling. Man, the relationship just isn't there. There's been a gap. I don't know what's going on. We need to fix this. Or, you know what? We're good, man. We're, we're, on, we're on target, man. It's just, we're in a good spot. We're in a good, why? Because relationships can go one or the other, right? And, and it's no different with us and Jesus. So when I come to a place to ask you, how are you and Jesus? That's a relationship foundation question. How are you and Jesus? Well, actually, we're doing good. Like, I'm really walking in this place to honor him. And whether I eat or drink or whatever I do, I do want to bring him glory, man. I, I, everything I think and everything I say and everything I do, I want it to be focused on him. Like, man, I'm trusting in him. I'm leaning in him. Like, I'm not afraid. Like, I'm trust. Like, or, or you know what? Oh, me and Jesus, that's a tough one. I don't know. You asked me at the wrong time because it's just not really great. And there's this distance. And I really haven't. I just felt like there's distance and we, we've spent some time apart and it's not on him and I know that and I need to get back in. Like, these are the answers, right? Oh, I know that and I need to get back into the word and I need to just spend more time on my face and it really is my worship is kind of taking a hit. I want to be able to... My, uh, and this psalm, it is about this amazing, incredible, beautiful relationship between the shepherd and the sheep and the sheep and the shepherd. And when you understand the depth of this psalm, it's not just something that we can quote. It, there's, it's not just something that we can finish a sentence. It's not just skim coating. It, it is this amazing relationship that I have with my shepherd. And he said it himself in John 10 verse 11, said the good shepherd lays himself down for the sheep. I love you enough, Sean, that I died for you. That's how the shepherd loves you. And based on that relationship, you come to a place to say, how's me and my shepherd? How's me and Jesus? Come on, if you would please get out your Bibles in Psalm 23. And if you don't have a Bible, come to your phone. We're going to read this together this morning. And I just, I want, I want us to read it together out loud. And, and I want to hear your voices in this as we come to this place. There's, there's so much to this. And I will do my best to get through this. Got through it in the first service. But I, I want to get this because I want us to understand this. I want to read this together. Are you ready to read it? Come on, one, two, three. Read it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Say this again. You are with me. Come on one more time. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies, and you have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Come on, amen. And you look at this based off of last week. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I lack nothing. When you, when you know the depth of the, the, the sheep, and, and again, I said this last week, when, when, when the Lord calls us sheep, that's not a compliment. That means we are completely dependent upon him. Left alone to ourselves, it's not going to go well. 
right? The Lord is my shepherd. Come on, how many times do you see people trying to be their own shepherd? If what, Hear me, please. Man, if you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, you are the shepherd of yourself, and that's not going to go well. If you don't know Christ Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, if you've never come to this place to, to believe in him, to call on his name for salvation, to surrender yourself, to repent from your sin, and believe that Jesus is the only answer, and confess that he is Lord, man, then you are playing shepherd for your yourself, and that's not going to go well. When you understand, no, it's the creator of the heavens and the earth. It is Jesus Christ who put himself on a cross. He says that he is my shepherd, laid himself down for me, that I'm going to put myself under him and walk under his care and see and watch my complete total dependence upon him. If I try to do this myself, I fail. Look what it says. I love this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me, and he makes me, I love this. He makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me besides quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. I love this. Watch this. He makes me, he leads me, he restores me, he guides me, and it's for his name's sake. Isn't it amazing that we come to a place to say, God, I want to walk in a way that brings you glory. I want me as a sheep to understand my dependence upon you and all my dependence upon you. I want to bring you glory in everything I think, everything I say, and everything I do, whether I eat or drink or whatever I do, do all for the glory of God. And when you understand the reality of what it means to eat and drink and whatever I do, what I think, what I say, and what I do, I want to bring you glory. Man, God is about God. And when you understand that we walk in a place to want to bring him glory, we, when that happens, watch this now, when that takes place in your spirit, when you understand there is a switch that takes place that it's no longer about me, but I live for him. You've given me everything. You've done more for me than I ever would deserve. I don't deserve any of it. And in this place, man, I want to walk in a way that whether I eat or whether I drink or or whatever I do, that covers you 24-7. God, I want to live for your glory. I want to bring you glory. Everything I think, say, and do. Now listen, there ain't nobody in this room batting a thousand. Ain't nobody in this room. Everything you think, everything you say, and everything you did. Man, most of us on this day failed. And what we thought today, or what we said today, or what we've done today, that it wasn't for his glory. But I love the, the idea of us as sheep saying, I'm dependent upon you and what I want to do. And you're leading me and guiding me and restoring me and making me. I want to walk in a place to say it's about your glory. Let that be this year. And when you walk in a place to understand the depth of this, you understand what it means to live for the shepherd. Because we're dependent upon him. And, man, and, and in this, we walk in a place. In verse 4, it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We covered this last week. That the valley of the shadow of death is a, is a real location. It's a real place. It's referenced as the darkest valley. And in this darkest valley, when you would walk through this valley, there was these amazing crevices and caves and hiding places that real bad guys would, would, would find themselves in just ready to attack and rob and ready to take from those who are passing through. There was amazing hiding places that you wouldn't be able to see the wolf or the bear or the lion in their hiding place that they were just ready to pounce on their prey. It was a very dangerous, dangerous walk. It was a very dangerous place. It was the darkest valley. And I love what we talked even last week, that to, to know that there is a very real place, that there's a beginning, and there's a very real end to this, but it's my responsibility to walk through this. we got to practice. Amen? Amen? Okay, there we go. We're getting it, and we're getting it, we're getting it. We walked this place to say, I, I need to walk through this. I need to get through this. How many times, though, do you walk through the valley of shadow of death? Or maybe it's your circumstance, or maybe it is the darkest valley, or maybe it is your darkest hour, and you come to a place, and you park the car, and you put your thumb in your mouth, and you just stop, and you boo-hoo until rescue comes. Man, we got to get our thumb out of our mouth, and we got to put the car in drive and put the pedal down and say, no, I'm going to get through this. I'm not going to stop. There's no parking in me. We're going to come to this place and say, I know I'm in it, and I know I'm in this dark place, and I know that there's the circumstances, and I know that there's things that are out of my control, and I'm going to walk in this place to say, God, I'm going to walk through. I'm going to keep going through the valley of shadow of death, through this darkest hour, through this darkest valley, and watch this, and I will fear no evil. I will not be afraid. Here it is. Here it is. Why? Because you are with me. 
Church, when you understand the depths of what it means that the God of all power and might, even us as New Testament saints and New Testament believers, that his spirit has dwelt within us and comes and stays and dwells and remains, that we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit to know, watch this, to know that no matter what takes place, you are with me. Why isn't that enough? Why is it that we allow fear to take a grip when the Psalm 23 comes to this place to say, listen, even though I walk, I will not be afraid. Why? Why will I not be afraid? The Bible answers it because you are with me. And when you know the God of all power and might, when you know the God who was always before and the God who is now and the God who is always will be and the God who knew you before you were born, knew you before the foundations of the earth, knew you in your mother's womb, knew that you had a destiny and you had a purpose and God has a plan for you and he knows every inch of your life. He knows what will take place today, tomorrow, and all of 2021. If the Lord would tarry, if Jesus doesn't return, he knows every inch of our lives. What happens when you come to a place to bank and trust and believe that God, you've got this. I'm going to walk in a place to trust you because you are with me no matter what. And in that, I will not be afraid. There is such victory and there is such boldness and there is such confidence in Psalm 23 verse 4. Come on, keep your finger there. Just flip over, please, to um, Numbers 14, because I want you to see this, because I think that this is uh, a, a real piece to this. Because you see in Numbers, you see throughout Numbers, this was the, the amazing uh, um, amazing time where, where the Lord is saying, listen, it's time to go in to the promised land. I, I've, I've set aside a land for you. It flows with milk and honey. Take 12 spies. Go check it out. And then I need you to go in and conquer the land. It's yours. Go get it. I've, I've set it aside for you. It's prepared for you. Don't worry about what you see in there. I'll take out the enemies. I'll take out the bad guys. You don't have to worry about that. I need you to take 12, go in, check it out, come back with a report, and then take everybody and go in. So they go in with the 12. You know the story. They come back. 10 out of the 12 are like, there's no way. Yeah, but does it flow with milk and honey? It's amazing. It's incredible. I've never seen anything like it. Man, the grapes are humongous. It's beautiful. It's incredible. Man, it's, an, it's the land that God has given us. It is the promised land. It is beautiful. It's everything that he said, but yet there's giants in the land. These guys are huge. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way that we win, but yet there was two. who said, if God is with us, he will take care of us. I want you to read it. Look at this. Numbers 14, I'll read it to you. Verse 8 says this, if the Lord is pleased with us. This is Caleb and Joshua, and I love what they're saying here. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Watch this. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Well, well, these are God's chosen people. And here you've got Caleb and Joshua saying, hey, listen, don't rebel against the Lord. And, and sometimes we see the word rebel, and, and it literally does mean to reject. It means to come against. But here these are people, God's chosen people, people that God has loved. And it's this sense of what does it look like when we rebel against the Lord? God says, I'm giving it to you. It's your land. Go in and possess it. Take it. And you come to this place Watch this. I want you to see this because there's a correlation to this in rebelling and fear. Look, look what he says. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. What happens when you watch this? When you know God has put a plan in, in destiny for you, you know that God has a purpose for you and you know what that plan is and you know what that purpose is and you know you need to walk in a way that would honor him. But all of a sudden, fear comes in. But you know this is God's plan for you. You see something in the scripture and you know this is what God has for me. This is the way of God. This is what I'm supposed to walk in righteousness, but we try to do it our own way. Listen, please understand this. When you rebel against the Lord, fear, hear this, please. Fear can cause you to rebel. Do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear them. When we walk in fear, we walk in disobedience, and that is a symbol of rebelling against the Lord. It doesn't mean you put up your hands and just all out reject. 
These are God's chosen people. And they walked in a place to let fear control. Even though Caleb and Joshua are like, what? come on, you guys, don't you get it? I can imagine their pleas. Don't you get it? Come on, the Lord is with us. He said he was going to be with us. He said that this is our land. He set it apart for us. He will take them out. This is the deal. Why are you afraid? God is with us. Again, why isn't that enough? Shouldn't it be enough just to know that the Lord is with me? He told me, Sean, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. I will never forsake you. Man, my spirit is within you. You walk in this place and not be afraid. I will take you by your righteous right hand. I will go before you. I will go behind you. I will be on your right. I will be on your left. I am with you. Do not be afraid. Come on, church. Why does it need to be more than that? We come to this place. Come on back to Psalm 23, please. We come to this place to see what he says. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. I love this because you are with me. Church, what happens if you would understand this year, 2021, that God is with you? And you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to be afraid. Even in your darkest hour, even in your darkest moment, even in your darkest season, that you come to a place to say, no more about me, but this is about you being with me, and I am a sheep, and I am solely, fully dependent upon my shepherd. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. I depend upon you. And then he says this. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And when you understand the rod and the staff for a shepherd, the shepherd would carry two sticks. One was the staff that had the shepherd's hook, and that would be used to guide the sheep, to prod the sheep, to move the sheep. If a sheep was going towards the raging river, the, 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 the shepherd would hook the sheep and bring them back, right? So the, 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 the staff was the one that just kind of the, the shepherd used to just kind of push the sheep and move the sheep and direct the sheep. He makes, makes them lie down with the staff. He leads them and he guides them with the staff. But the rod was a whole different tool in the belt, man. The rod was the stick. This, this thick stick. And, and to make a rod, a shepherd would make the rod out of the trunk of, of the toughest tree, out of the wood of the trunk of the tree, the base of the tree, center of that tree is where the thick wood is. And they would take this rod, right? And they would, they would use this rod to protect the sheep. Do you remember, again, this is David writing. Do you remember David went to King Saul going up against Goliath? David just as a delivery boy, he was, he was bringing lunch to his brothers, right? He comes in and Goliath comes out and David goes to King Saul and said, listen, let me at him. I can take him down. And King Saul is like, you're just a lad. Yeah, but when I was shepherding my father's flock, I took out the lion and the bear. Well, how'd he do that? I, I struck him down, he says, the lion and the bear. Why? Because he knew how to yield his, his rod. He, listen, he didn't, have, he, didn't, he didn't have the shotgun, right? He didn't have the 307. He didn't have the rifle. I would prefer if a bear's coming not to just have a stick in my hand. You know what I'm saying? If the lion's charging, I'd, I'd be taking that stick, throwing it at him and going the other direction. Like, I wouldn't know what to do. I'll just pull out the guns and start shooting at the lion or the bear. But you got to understand something. The reality is this. This is a real picture of the rod. That the shepherd knew how to work that rod. David, as a young boy, as a shepherd, he knew. Practice after practice after practice after practice, he knew that if a bear comes, the rod is enough to protect the sheep. If the lion comes, the rod is enough to protect the sheep. And he knew how to take that stick that was this firm stick and go and chase after the bear and chase after the lion and take their life so they couldn't come after the sheep. I love where it says, and they comfort me. When I biblically know, not in a cliche, when I biblically know the shepherd has my back. The shepherd has my back. I don't have to worry about what's coming up from the left side or the right side or behind me. The shepherd has my back. His, his rod and his staff, they comfort me. And then he says this, and this is where I want to close out. We, 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 know, we know verse 6, his, his, his goodness and his loving kindness, they follow me all the days of my life. 
and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That speaks about his presence. That speaks about this eternity that we have with him. That speaks about now. The, the, in Old Testament, the house of the Lord, it meant his presence. That's where his presence was. We talk about that often. We know that God is good. We know, we know that he is good. We understand that his loving kindness and his mercy. And to understand the depth of that as a shepherd and a sheep, they follow me all the days of my life. There's not a moment that he doesn't love me. There's not a moment that I can't tap into his grace. His mercy is new every morning. These are amazing staples as us, as, as followers of, of, of God. We know that. But I want to spend the rest of our time right here in, in verse 5. It says this, you prepare a table for me. Where? And, and this literally means a table. This means dinner. That I would dine with you. Well, where does he prepare a table for me? In the presence of my enemies. Come on, I want you to get this. I want you to understand this because this is this is huge. When we come to a place to realize how's you and Jesus. When you understand the shepherd, this whole psalm is about relationship. It is the shepherd and the sheep relationship where the shepherd prepares a table. I love this. Where the David, the psalmist, he says, you have prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies. I would love this to say, who's, you don't have to raise your hand because they might be in the room. I don't know. Who's had an enemy before, right? Don't look at your husband or your wife, but who's had a real enemy and you're like, God, I don't want to sit at a table in their presence. I want you to lightning bolt them and take them out. Like, just kill them, end them, like, remove them, like, do something, lightning bolt them, take out the enemy, and, and we'll be good. That's Sean's version, which is a sinful version. That's a bad idea. That's how I would write it. But inspired by the Holy Spirit, David says, you have prepared a table. And I love this, and this is a real picture. This is a real table that we dine at. And I love this, that uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, every year we have a Christmas party at our house, and it's for our staff and their, and, their, and their spouse and their kids. And Renee just creates this table. We add chairs to it, and we add another table, and she puts, I mean, you, you, you ladies are amazing in how you decorate a table, and she puts the candles, and puts the table runner, and she puts the greenery, and it's like, you don't want to eat off of this thing. It's the table, but you don't want to eat off it because it's like, take your pictures, because when I sit down and I get up, it looks like I sat down and ate, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's a mess at the table. And, and, and the table is significant to the people that are around that table. And we love our team. In the, in the next few weeks, we'll be speaking on how blessed we are as a church. And I hope you never take the staff of this church for granted. We have, we have an unbelievable staff. We have an unbelievable team. Our volunteers get the gold star every week, though. We have unbelievable gold, gold star for our volunteers. But when you come to this place to see every person around our table for that, and it's, one of, it's personally one of our favorite nights of the year. Because the people around that table are significant and huge in relationship with us. They mean everything to us. So when you talk about sitting at a table, you talk about who's been invited into the table. I love that the shepherd prepares a table so that you and I could come to a place to sit down at this table for me and Jesus. And at this table we eat and at this table we dine and at this table we talk and at this table we, we pray and at this table we build relationship and we build relationship and we build relationship we build relationship and it is watch this, it is in the presence of our enemy, please hear this, please hear me the enemy doesn't have a seat at the table the enemy doesn't have a seat at the table when, 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 you, when you understand this listen, he could have, he could have put the table somewhere else he could put a table on a place where your enemies would never see it. Like, like I love this. Now understand this. When he prepared the table in the presence of his enemies, the enemies could do nothing to prevent that. The, watch this. Please hear me. When you understand the enemies in, in your world, those who will whisper, those who will come against, those who will lie, when you look at the chief enemy, Satan himself will come and he will whisper in your ear and he, and he will whisper into your spirit and he will try to cause destruction to you. Don't give him a seat at the table. 
You walk in a place to realize that God Almighty, who has my back, who says, Sean, I am the good shepherd and you lack nothing. And we sit at this table together and the pride could have put this table anywhere. But I want you to know that there's nothing that your enemies or the enemy can do to prevent this relationship. You got to understand that. Why would he put it right in the midst of our enemies? He could have put the table anywhere. Church, that's for us and our complete dependence upon him to say, listen, there's nothing that the whispers can do about our relationship. There's nothing that the enemy has any power or authority or right to our relationship. Satan himself prowls around like a roaring lion. Listen, he will always prowl and he has that access to walk around the perimeter, but do not give him a seat at your table. Don't give him a seat at your table. This is me and Jesus. This is me and Jesus. You better be very careful who you allow at your table. If you're a teenager in this place, you're a young adult, you're single, you better be very careful who you allow at your table. You better be very careful who you allow into your dating relationship or friendship. You would be very careful, man, if it is the enemy, if it is somebody who don't know Jesus, I say this often, please hear me, please hear me. Don't give them a seat at your table. I don't care how nice he is. I don't care who he is. I don't care how hot she is. I don't care what she looks like. If they don't love and serve Jesus and worship Christ, do not give them a seat at your table. If you're watching this online and you're single, don't give them a seat at your table. Don't give them a seat at your table. It will wreck you. Me and Jesus, me and my shepherd, I'm completely dependent upon him. I'm not allowing anyone at my table that would be considered my enemy. I am not allowing Satan himself, let him prowl around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. But I'm not giving you a seat at my table. Listen, the enemy will pull right up to that table and he will try to make it a three-way and he'll try to walk in this place to interfere with you and Jesus. When Jesus is trying to communicate, Satan will begin to whisper, no, you're not worth that. No, that's not the plan. That can't be the plan. There's no way that that can be the plan. When you allow enemy at the seat of your table, he will whisper and he will get in the way of this. Me and Jesus, me and Jesus, me and Jesus, me and my shepherd. I'm dependent upon you. Don't need no whispers. Don't need no lies. Don't need no gossip. Don't need no slander. Don't need no lies. I don't need you whispering to me. I know God's plan for me. I will not be afraid. I'm walking through this. I will not be afraid. Well, you should be afraid. I'm not going to be afraid. Well, this is going to take place. I'm going to trust in God. And there's just, there's so much to take place that you come to a place and say, it's not going to happen. You're not sitting at my table. This is me and Jesus. Come on, what happens when you see the shepherd is for the sheep? The sheep are dependent, fully dependent upon the shepherd who sits at your table matters. And you walk in this place. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And can I say this? Sometimes we can get so distracted. that we forget, watch it, we forget who's sitting right here. Sean, I'm your shepherd. I set a table for you, and on that table, you lack nothing. Don't look around. Sean, don't, don't look over here. Sean, it's not greener on the other side of the fence. Sean, don't look, don't look, oh, Sean, stop looking right here. Sean, I'm your, I, I'm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Sean, I'm your shepherd, and I've given you everything that you need. Stop looking around. In church every year, we do a word. As a staff, we do a word. Renee and I have been doing this for years. We pick a word for the year. And I encourage you to pick a word for the year. And and, and if the Lord would tarry, man, at the end of December of 2021, you come to a place and say, how did I I do in fulfilling my word? And it's a word that that we pray about. As a staff, we come together and and we look and we we go over a word and and I encourage them uh, to pray about it. Like make this thing significant, make it deep. And my word this year is vertical. Because I I don't want to be horizontal. I think 2020, I think we got so crazy about the horizontal. 
We were so into this and we were so into that and we were so into this and we, this was a distraction and this was a distraction and then nobody knows what's going on over here and there's so much confusion over here where the news says this, the election says this and everything became so horizontal we forgot the vertical. And when I sit at this table, it's me and Jesus. It's me and my shepherd. And, and we look around, Sean, stop looking around. Sean, don't worry about that. Sean, that's not your business. Sean, that's not your business. Sean, come on, vertical, me and Jesus. Matthew 6 says this, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. When I serve the vertical and I live for the vertical and I seek first his kingdom and I seek first his righteousness, all the horizontal will work out. When you come to this place to say, Lord, it's me and you. Jesus, it's me and you. This is our table. This is where we dine. This is the relationship that's being built. I can't look over here. and I'm not worried about that. I can't just keep going over the horizontal. I can't just keep being so crazy and so concerned about 2020 and so concerned about all this that it just becomes so heavy. It just becomes, and then it's in the way where you let it at the table. And it is truly my desire to walk in a place Say, Jesus, I want to be so focused first on your kingdom and first on what you say is right and your righteousness. And then, and then, and there's an and then. After that, all these things will be added unto you. The horizontal will take care of itself when I focus on Jesus and I focus on the vertical. How do I serve? What do I think? What do I say? What do I do? How do I honor you? How do I walk in a fear of you? How do I walk without fear? How do I walk in a saying, if you say go, I go. If you say do this, I do this. If you say speak to this person, I speak to this person. If you say to give this, I give this. Because I want to function and live in the vertical and not be worried about the horizontal because it's me and Jesus. Because the shepherd set a table for me and him and the presence of my enemy. And no one is allowed at this table. Me and Jesus. It is this amazing picture of the shepherd caring for the sheep. Come on, if you could just bow your heads for me, please, just for a moment. You come in a place, let me ask you, how are you and Jesus? At the start of 2021, how are you and Jesus? Who have you led at the table? That's a distraction between you and Jesus. Have you come to a place to give a seat to the enemy? Have you come to a place to allow him to pull up a chair? Let him prowl. That's what he does. Let him prowl. But don't give him a seat. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. And that's enough. That's enough. I'm going to be good with that. You never leave me. You never forsake me. Matter of fact, you pulled up a table and you want to dine with me even in enemies all around, even in their presence. The enemies, they're all around, yet you just want me to be so, watch this, so solely focused on you. My attention is on you. I'm not looking to the right. I'm not looking to the left. My attention is on my shepherd because he will lead me and he will make me and he will lead me and he will restore me and he will guide me because he's a good shepherd and he loves me as a sheep and I need him and I depend upon him and I'm not going to look to the right or to the left. I'm focused on, I'm sitting at the table. Can you just picture yourself? Please just close your eyes and just picture yourself at a table with Jesus with no distractions. The enemies can be all around right in their presence, but you're so focused on the shepherd to know you have my back because it is your staff and it is your rod and they come from me and you will protect me and I'm dependent upon you. I will not be my own shepherd. I trust in you and I believe in you and you set a table for me right here no matter what's going on all around in the presence of my enemy it's me and you. Jesus, it's me and you. And in that I feel safe, protected, secure, 
and you anointed my head with oil, which means there's this separation that when you anoint the head with oil, Old Testament, it, it referenced this sense of, of a separation that would take place, a holiness, a sanctification process. In my cup, it overflows. Jesus, you always tend to your sheep. And I see this table with me and you, and we're just dining, and we're having this relationship, and I'm filled with peace. There's peace within this table, and there's joy at this table, and there's laughter at this table, and I love you, and I'm amazed by you, and I thank you for giving your life up. I thank you for protection. I thank you for your guidance. I thank you for your wisdom. I thank you for your caring for me. Even when I walk away, you chase me down. Even when I was wayward, you came after me. You left the others to come chase me down. I see this relationship. I sit at this table and I'm just amazed by you and I love you and I want to walk in this relationship that would honor and glorify you. Jesus, you are my shepherd and I'm a sheep who completely depends upon you and in that, it's going to be okay. I see me and Jesus at a table. and I give no place for the enemy. I wonder if you would just stand to your feet as Olivia sings. I'm just asking that you would keep that picture in your mind today. And we walk in this place. Say, Jesus, me and you. It's enough to know that you are with me and you protect me and you'll guide me. Come on, amen.